Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So today we have our econ show and we're gonna go through some, some different uh, key pieces. So uh, in segment one, we wanna look at some of the most recent leading indicators that have come out. You know, they show that we've moved further into contraction, especially in the OECD nations. And we wanna look at how that is kind of married with what is happening on the food side when we look at, uh, at, at uh, potential growing. And again, that leads back to inflation. And then where are we on the shipping side? Where are we on the logistics? Then we're going to follow to why the Fed's path to that 50 basis point, uh, basis point hike still remains in place. We're going to look at some of the different math behind it, all those different pieces. Uh, then we're going to look at what is happening to the consumer. We want to look at some of the key pieces and, and components of consumption, where were retail sales, uh, you know, adjusted for inflation, not adjusted for inflation. How are some of these things adjusting as we go into the uh, it really into the holiday season and then beyond? Then we want to look at Europe, who had some of the inflation data come out. It did not get any better. Uh, things continue to get worse. And we want to look at some of that. And then we're going to turn to and do a lot of uh, uh, talking through Chinese data and Indian data, because there's a lot of key pieces that have happened in that point where we've had some of the different flows, some of the different data points that are showing additional pain when we look at what is happening in China and India. Uh, India's uh, so far like things started to slow down, but we want to look at where are they right now and, th and things in China have gotten worse and we want to talk through that. So with that being said, we're going to jump right into what is happening on the credit impulse side. So there's these are very important because credit impulses are showing you, <coughs> excuse me, where where are, where is credit going? Is it moving through the system? Is it not moving through the system? So the global credit impulse is a forward leading indicator for growth and in inflation. In late 2020, it predicted a 50% year over year uh, increase in EPS growth and other types of and an inflation of over 7%. Now it's calling for negative earnings and a drop in a lot of this activity. So that's why, you know, when you look at some of the different moves, this on the on the it's it's showing that inflation should come down. We clearly believe that there's more stagflation, but when you look at just activity, we're not seeing debt move through. You know, we've already talked about how we're at the lowest level of underwriting that we've been at since 2011. You know, there there is a pause in the market. And when you look at some of the other leading indicators on global manufacturing, you can see we've already gone into contractionary territory, which is why when we talk about oil and oil demand, we see additional downside, not only in Q4, but more, more importantly and bigger in the next year in 2023. And in Q1, we expect to see some additional write downs. You know, we talked in, on, on the EIA show segment three on how OPEC had adjusted some of their flows, how you, you started to see them take down demand. And we said that their demand numbers were already too high. And now as you see diesel slowing, you see shipping slowing, trade slowing, activity slowing, that is obviously going to be a lot of those downward momentums. When you look at, uh, this is the most recent data coming from the US on the drought here, you can see why the winter wheat is doing so poorly, why we continue to see these problems. And this is not changing anytime soon. And that's when you start looking abroad and you look uh, you know, out at all of the grains pricing. Obviously, we're in a period where there's, there's a, some volatility, but we do see a down, an upward momentum when you're looking at some of the prices on grains and whatnot as we go into next year, which is going to, again, be in an inflationary push, keeping us in that stagflationary backdrop. And I think one of the more important ones is the OECD leading indicator when you can see it's it's now steeper into contraction. And when you look at where we are, this is a place that we haven't been at since 2007, 2008. And that's the, the, the crux of what we're talking about, because when you see this drop, this is just feeding back to that those leading indicators on credit impulses. PMI is already in uh, negative territory. For, it was it was for services now for manufacturing. That's where we continue to see this onset. And then when you look at UN food and agriculture food prices, you know it's up two percent year on year. But look at the year on year comp. The comps get harder. So you're still 
increasing, but at a slower rate, but it's still going up. And one of the things that we always talk about, it's like, this is uh, the similar to us already going 150 miles an hour. And people are like, oh, well, we're slowing down. It's like, yeah, but instead of going from one, 150 miles per hour to 180, you're going from 150 to 152. You're still going at, a, at 150 miles per hour. And the, how much can the consumer handle? And the problem is on the, on the food and ag side, when you look at processing, when you look at diesel, when you look at fertilizers and all other inputs to the growing process, they're not getting any cheaper. You know, have prices stopped going up? Absolutely. I will not argue that at all, but they haven't come down either. And when you look at where diesel is, when you look at where fertilizers are going, there's still that upward momentum. But even as there's that upward momentum, new export order indices, firmly negative. I mean, in Germany, you're in the th- in the 30s. I mean, you're, you're not looking at something where it's like, oh, things are starting to peter out a bit. You are steeply in contraction on new export orders, which is showing you where this is going and how slow things are getting, which is strengthened by inbound ocean TEU, TEU volumes from China to the U.S. The freight, uh, freight to Baltic index from China, East Asia to the U.S. East-West Coast increased at the beginning of November, but TEU volume capacity indices were signaling that this attempt by carriers at a general rate increase would be unsuccessful. FBX headed back. So now you look at the overnight, the FBXD dropped another $406 to $1919 for, per 40 uh, foot container on the West line, a new low for 2022. So again, you're starting to see that roll over. Then you look at the different indexes and how all of this is moving down. Now, this is a deflationary side. It's deflationary in a good way in the sense where shipping costs are coming down. This should be helpful, but it's also showing you that trade is slowing. If trade is slowing, that means that manufacturing is slowing. If manufacturing is slowing, it means that consumers are slowing and spending is slowing. And again, it it, it keeps expanding out, which is why when, when we talk and, and we had some comments asking like, you know, can you outline what this means? And it's just when you're looking at the, the global trade, when you're looking at global growth, there is none. You know, right now we're in contraction, not a growth phase. And it's just a matter of when does that filter down to the underlying data points. Japan, uh, Japanese GDP was or came in negative. Uh, you know, we expect Europe to come in negative. And that that's going to expand out. And especially when you look at China, China is the second largest, uh, you know, uh, country in the world. And they import a lot, you know, raw materials, intermediate goods. So if they're not importing as much, well, that's going to, again, that's going to have a, a, a second and third derivative impact, which we're now starting to see. You know, when you look at China reopening, there's a hope that as China reopens, even though new orders are down, that that would be a good thing for, for, uh, for Brazil for Germany. But when you look at new orders moving in the wrong direction for China, that's going to, again, pull down some of the impact, the impacts from Brazil, from other areas, which is why, again, that that second and third order of magnitude just shows how the slowdown is going to reverberate through the system because everything is interconnected. Everyone likes to say, oh, well, that's only their problem or that's only this problem. There's all this interconnected nature, which is why when you look at treasuries, for an example, like liquidity has deteriorated. Even though there's a massive amount of outstanding debt, there's no buyer. So there's more than enough sellers. There's more than enough new, uh, new debt coming, but who is buying it? And, as, and, and that's why rates go up, because you have to incentivize people to show up and actually spend. You know, then you look at corporate debt lags, the momentum seen in emerging market sovereign dollar debt. So when you look at emerging market dollar debt, that's why when we look at EM, that's where we see the biggest move lower because the, the, there needs to be this makeup trade. And, and there's been people trying to find some sort of support, some sort of growth. And now I think you're going to see that come down and that catch up, which is going to be painful. Then when you look at the different uh, pipelines coming for the Permian, you know, this is going to be important to help try to bring down pricing on the LNG front because all of this new pipe is directed towards the export market from the U.S. 
So the, uh, the hope is that you're going to get some of this from the U.S. and be able to push more into the market, but it's going to take time. You know, you're looking at pipes that aren't coming on until 2023, 2024, and it's really marrying with the LNG capacity, which is going to help essentially cap prices. But given the shift in the piped gas market, the LNG market, it won't, it, it'll still keep prices very elevated and again, be that kind of backstop for those elevated prices around the world. Now, China is obviously burning more coal because of this. And when you look at why they're burning more coal, it's 61% of all of their power is already produced by coal. Excuse me, that's now gone up. And the, the six, so in terms of what the U.S. consumes, so the U.S. consumes the same amount of power, uh, 62% of what China consumes is what the U.S. completely consumes. So 100% of our power consumption is 61% of Chinese consumption. So they consume the amount of power that the U.S. does in a day, and they're all powered by coal, which given the fact that they have a severe drought that still continues, the, the hydropower doesn't work, so they have to turn on the generators. The generators you know, diesel's expensive, so they're using coal. Again, more of these pressure points coming through. And then Germany continued to nationalize another entity, and they, but they're in this this movement up, and, and it's been warm over there, which has been a positive to try to help bridge some of those gaps in terms of storage and activity, but it's starting to get colder. It's winter. And so you're going to see that, that demand rise, which again is going to put more pressure on inflationary cycles because right now you know things are still expensive and we expect this to come higher at this point in time semiconductor demand by region has uh, has been fairly flat and we do expect that to come down a bit and there is a lot of inventory that has to be cleared and that's going to be a big component when you start looking at some of the metrics on the inflationary front Global money supply, global money supply growth is fading quickly. Uh, Eurozone, China, Japan, and others seeing contraction M2 growth reach negative 5.4%. But remember, there was a massive injection of liquidity, and it's been endless since at least 2008. Obviously, it started before that when you look at just the growth of money supply. And now there's there was such a surge, some of that has to be taken back. But that this is what the UN is looking at when they say, oh, this is terrible policy. No, this is the right policy. What's happening now should have happened last year. And because it didn't happen last year, it's creating a reverberating impact that is going to last longer because they held back so long. Container sales 2022 to date has seen a total of 292 uh, container sales with the majority of these transactions taking place in the first half of the year. In October, there were just nine container sales reported. Of the sales recorded, four went to Greek buyers. So you're seeing more containers getting built, but now you're seeing trade slow. So now you're going to get an oversupply again, which is what happened in what dry ships. If you remember all of that back with the bulkers in 07, 06 through 09, and what that led to, here we are with something similar. Then you look at U.S. spot prices for memory chips. All of this has started to come down, which is a good thing for inflation because you had a big increase in pricing. But now as inventories build, prices come down, but a lot of in, uh, people have already purchased. So you know, with when you think about new purchases, and that's that fiscal drag that we've talked about, this is it, where inventories have rebuilt. No buyers are there, but now your inventories keep growing while you now sit on a glut. China is slowed, Japan is slowed, the U.S. is slowed, you, uh, Europe is slowed. So where are you going to clear this? And which is why we do expect to see prices come down again, which is a nice deflationary backdrop. But it, but there's uh, those mixtures between the two. So that's what we have for you on the global side. The next segment is going to go deeper into the U.S. and what's happening on that front. <laughs> 